Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we're going to have several talks on <clears throat> music and language relationships at this conference, so I'm not going to try and cover um, the whole thing. I, I'm going to address one particular issue and question that has become very interesting recently to me and a number of colleagues. Uh, before I do that, I just want to issue an invitation for those of you that are finding yourself interested in this research on music cognition. There is a Society for Music Perception and Cognition devoted to the scholarly study of music in the mind, founded in 1990, and there's a web page with links to conferences. This conference is actually listed on that page. Uh, videos of talks from various conferences and so forth. You just can Google SMPC and it'll get you right there, so please consider taking a look. So a very important question about music in the mind is how is music related to other cognitive functions? Dr. Um, Briggs this morning uh, raised the question of how it's related to attention. And there's been lots of interest for many, actually hundreds of years, in how music is related to numerical cognition. Uh, the mathemat mathematician Leibniz thought music was a sort of uh, unconscious numerical form of numerical cognition. Um, relationships to spatial cognition have been of interest and have been studied. And of course, what I'm talking about is relationships to language. And th these kinds of questions are quite relevant for issues of education and for mental health, because if we think music can impact these and has connections to these, that has clear implications for how we might use music for uh, purposeful uh, treatment. So what does music share with language? To, the, the basic question is to what extent are there underlying mental processes shared or distinct? Now this is a question that has attracted a lot of theoretical writing and debate. Leonard Bernstein gave a famous set of lectures at Harvard in the 70s called The Unanswered Question, which are wonderful to watch. They're all on video, I highly recommend them. Um, later published as a book. And uh, he, he, he speculated there were many deep connections between how we process the structure of music and the structure of language. Um, later, a, a very influential book by Lairdall and Jackendoff called A Generative Theory of Tonal Music looked at this question again from a different perspective and came to different, somewhat different conclusions, um, saying that maybe there were fewer connections than people had thought um, before. But uh, what's new in the last decade is the growing amount of empirical research on this question. And this is an area that a number of people in this audience, uh, my colleagues, have been very active in. Um, and I got into this whole field through the work of Isabel Peretz and her work on this question. So some surprising connections are emerging between music and language um, in this empirical research, and that's what I want to focus on today. And I want to focus on connections between speech and instrumental music, partly because that's in many ways, they're so different. They're d distinct modes of communication. They're both very ancient. Um, the oldest known musical instruments are over 35,000 years old, as uh, was shown in some papers published in Nature, these, from these flutes uh, from Germany. They're both very acoustically complex, but there are very many salient differences between speech and instrumental music. So if we hear Pablo Casals playing his cello, and then we hear Pablo Casals cursing his cello, you can see that uh, those sounds are going to be very, very different, and we won't have any trouble distinguishing uh, between them. So for example, uh, in music, we have these fixed pitches that we don't have in any language of the world when people move from syllable to syllable. And in speech, we have rapid and large spectral changes between successive syllables, which we don't see in very many musical traditions uh, in terms of how melodies are structured. Now, I should mention that relationships between speech and song are going to be addressed by Isabel Peretz and Gottfried Schlag. And so I won't be talking about those in this talk. So a new research direction that's been inspired by modern work on neural brain plasticity is, is sort of a shift from asking what does music share with language to the question of does music shape language abilities? Does regular engagement with learning a musical instrument actually change the way your brain processes language? Um, and if so, what abilities are affected? How are they influenced? And why? Why would this even happen in the first place? And of course, you could back up a, a step and say, well, why would you even ask such a question, given the many differences between instrumental music and speech? Well, empirically, it's, it, it seems that instrumental music training is associated with enhanced, a number of enhanced things that have to do with language, enhanced verbal short-term memory, enhanced hearing of speech and noise, um, enhanced linguistic reading ability. Uh, and I, I starred that one uh, because that is actually a randomized control study published in Cerebral Cortex. Uh, enhanced decoding of affective prosody and enhanced L2 or second language phonological abilities, learn, learning how to pronounce the sounds of a second language. And many of these studies are correlational. Um, so what's really needed are randomized controlled training studies like the Moreno study and also that combine behavioral and neural measures as the Moreno study did. 
And the question that ultimately must be answered is, does experience play an important role, or are all these just pure uh, coincidence, or in the sense, correlations without causation? Uh, maybe some people are just born with better auditory systems than others, and therefore they're better at music and these variety of, of linguistic skills. Or is musical training actually changing the structure of the brain in a way that influences these things? Now, uh, if I had to actually put money down on uh, what we're going to find after we do the right kinds of studies, I would bet that we're going to discover that experience does play an important role. I'm sure innate differences are also at play, but I think experience will turn out to be an important factor. Then the question will become, how do these effects occur in the brain and why do they occur? And how, in some sense, is perhaps easier to answer because I think most people believe these changes are due to experience-dependent neuroplasticity. That is, actually learning an instrument, changing the structure of your brain. Um, but what brain systems are affected? Is it attention systems? Is it auditory working memory? Is it executive function or other brain systems? And why? Why would these changes really happen? And this is where I think we need specific hypotheses that make testable predictions. And this is really important if we're going to capitalize on these effects. So in an effort to kind of make a contribution in this regard, I published a paper um, last year called Why Would Musical Training Benefit the Neural Encoding of Speech? The Opera Hypothesis. And the idea here is that learning to play a musical instrument drives adaptive plasticity um, in speech processing networks when five conditions are met. Overlap, precision, emotion, repetition, and attention. And the first letter gives the, of each of those gives the, uh, the hypothesis its name. So overlap in brain networks that process an acoustic feature used in music and speech. Precision, and here's the key, and that's the key idea, novel idea, is that music places higher demands on those networks in terms of precision. Emotion, the musical activities that engage in network are associated with positive emotion. Um, they're associated with extensive repetition and with focused attention. And those last three factors, the ERA, are help, what help drive the neuroplasticity. So the idea is that when the conditions are met, neuroplasticity drives the networks to function with higher precision than needed for ordinary speech communication. And yet, since speech and music share those networks, speech processing benefits. OK, so I'm going to try and get you through this idea fairly quickly. Um, talking about the neural encoding of speech and some evidence for enhanced encoding in musicians and suggestive experience that evidence that experience really does play a role. I'll talk about this idea of precision and encoding demands in speech versus music, focusing on the precision of fundamental frequency encoding. That's the basic periodicity of the voice that gives us our sense of pitch. And then talk a little bit about emotion, repetition, and attention as factors that promote neuroplasticity, and then touch on why would you use music training to enhance speech in the real world. Even if all this is true, why wouldn't you just, if you wanted to improve somebody's speech perception, why wouldn't you just train them in speech? Why, why would you want to use music? OK, um, well, the brain processing of speech involves an elaborate interaction between the cortical processing of sound up here in the higher brain centers and auditory cortex and other regions, and subcortical, what we think of as these lower, more uh, ancient brain centers, um, brainstem and midbrain, so structures like the inferior colliculus and the cochlear nucleus and superior olivary complex and so forth. Uh, I've circled them here in this kind of cut through side on view of the brain. Now, subcortical activity in the brain can be recorded non-invasively. You can actually measure what's going on way down there through by putting electrodes just on this, the scalp. And you have to average a lot and, and collect a lot of data to get these signals, which are tiny, but you can do it. And it's routinely done using EEG. And these are experiments where people are just listening passively to a sound repeated over and over. There's no attention required. You're just recording the sort of their, their encoding of that sound in these lower centers, or some reflection of that. Now, what we're really talking about here is the brain's basement. And this is really generally neglected in cognitive studies. I think everything we've heard about today has been about things happening in the cortex with music. And that makes sense. Music is a complex stimulus that engages a lot of the cortex. But in audition, a great deal of processing happens before sound even reaches the cortex. There's seven or eight centers, brain centers, that are where sound processing occurs. And that's unusual. That's quite different from vision in terms of how much rich processing is going, down, going on downstairs before things even get up to the to the upstairs, to the forebrain. Now, um, what is the relationship between all this low-level stuff in the basement and cognition? Um, well, one way of thinking about it is to think about it as not being that interesting, that it, in a sense, all this subcortical stuff is, in a sense, from the cognitive perspective, more like a, a delivery service. You know, it's, it's taking care of some things like sound localization and, you know, uh, detection of certain features, but it's basically passing up the interesting stuff it's upstairs where all the interesting stuff happens. It's a one-way uh, street. But there's a different way of thinking about it that's 
less like a FedEx truck and more like a call center, that it's, it's sort of a sensory cognitive hub. It's where information that's going up meets, as shown in this cutaway view from Nina Krauss's uh, a paper by Nina Krauss, the black lines showing these are the, the, cochlea, the cochlea, where sound first is transduced into neural responses. These black lines show ascending information, but these red lines show descending information from the higher centers back onto these lower centers. So in other words, information going upstairs meets information going downstairs at every stage of the auditory pathway, all the way out to the outer um, hair cells of the cochlea. Um, and I think that makes it a more interesting uh, kind of structure to think about. Well, this, is, uh, this work I'm talking about today is largely from the laboratory of Nina Krauss. And she's found um, that brainstem activities reflect syllable acoustic structure. Now, what does that mean? That means if you record the EEG response of the brain to a spoken syllable and actually look at it in a computer screen, it actually physically resembles the sound that the person is hearing. So this is an actual um, picture of the sound waveform of the syllable da. So this is time and this is amplitude. And the black is the sound wave trace. And the red is actually the amplified um, brainstem response. And you can just eyeball this and see that it looks kind of similar. This is neural and that's acoustic. And you can even blow it up and zoom in and you see there's a lot of similarity between the brainstem response and the acoustic um, stimulus in these lower centers. Okay, that's sort of interesting, but you could ask, well, so what? Well, so what is that you could, this means you can measure a number of things, including how similar that brain response is to the incoming signal, what's called response fidelity, how well your brain is sort of, in a sense, reflecting what's happening in the outside world. And you can quantify that in a number of ways, using temporal correlation and so forth. And it turns out that distinct aspects of response fidelity um, predict real-world language skills. And, and Nina and colleagues have shown this in a number of studies. So you can measure these responses and, and things about their timing and how well, how well they reflect the sounds that you're hearing actually predict high-level cognitive things like word reading scores and hearing and noise, even after you control for IQ and responses to clicks and, and other sorts of things. Um, so that's, there's some sort of connection. Um, and also there's plasticity in this response, and that's is really what's made this whole area very interesting. And I want to give you an example of that, and an example of this idea of response fidelity. And this has to do with tracking of the pitch of the voice, the fundamental frequency of the voice, in Mandarin syllables by what's called the frequency following response. So this is the sustained part of this response. So if this is a syllable, that's the onset of the da, the kind of burst, the d, and this is the ah, and this is the brain response. And this, this sustained response, this very oscillatory part, is reflecting the oscillatory uh, structure of this, which carries information about pitch. And you can quantify that by just measuring um, those oscillations. And this has been done having people listen to syllables of Mandarin, where different patterns of pitch completely change the meaning of a word. So the syllable ma can mean mother, hemp, horse, or skull, depending on which pitch contour you put on it. So these are the four pitch contours of Mandarin. A flat contour is one kind of tone, a rising contour is another kind of tone, and so on. And there are four contours. This is about 250 milliseconds. Well, if you measure, this is taken from measurements of the acoustic signal. If you measure the, the periodicity in the brain response and plot it on top of the acoustic signal, you see remarkable tracking of the signals uh, in the brain. Okay, so one of the interesting findings that came out of this early research is that Mandarin, native Mandarin speakers actually tracked the pitch contours better. Their brain responses were more faithfully reflective of the sound of the, 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 the pitch of the syllable than native English speakers, suggesting either inborn differences or some role for brain plasticity. Well, this inspired a study by Patrick Wong and colleagues where they took musicians who didn't know the first thing about Mandarin, and they asked, well, how would their brains track these Mandarin syllables, these tones in Mandarin? And they had them listen to these syllables while they recorded these brainstem responses. And just to give you some idea of what they found, these are some representative images of these brainstem responses from a musician and a non-musician as they heard a syllable with this black contour, which is the tone, that's sort of a dipping contour. And you can see that the yellow line shows the, the response of the brain. The tracking is significantly more accurate in the musician's brain than in the non-musician's brain. And there was a suggestion that plasticity played a role in that how well you track that uh, was related to how many years of musical training you had. So in other words, um, experience, the amount of experience predicted how well you track this linguistic thing, your amount of musical experience. Okay. And actually, in randomized experimental studies, this response has been shown to be plastic in studies of non-musical um, phenomena of pitch tracking. Okay, so that's all interesting and good. Maybe musicians track 
a linguistic pitch better, but does that have any real world consequences for our lives? Well, one kind of interesting possible consequence is it may contribute to enhanced speech perception and noise. It turns out that the uh, fundamental frequency contour, that is the rising and falling pitch of the voice as, as somebody speaks, affects speech perception and noise. So if you take a sentence and you have somebody listen to it and you artificially flatten with a computer the pitch contour so it, some, it sounds like a monotone, people are worse at understanding what those words are when spoken in noise. Somehow that, that variation is helping us pull out speech and noise. And we're constantly faced with noise situations in schools and cocktail parties. As we age, this is a serious problem. Understanding speech and noise and hearing aids aren't particularly helpful. They just amplify everything, including the noise. So um, having some advantage in your brain for doing that is significant. And empirically, it turns out that musicians do show enhanced speech perception and noise. And this has been now shown in children, in young adults, and older adults. And these are some data from Nina and colleagues. The red bars show speech perception and noise in musically trained individuals, and the white bars in musically untrained individuals across different ages in these three different groups. And the graph on the right, again, shows the relationship between years of musical training and how well you perceive speech and noise. So again, a suggestion that training in music is having some impact on the structure and function of the brain in terms of speech. Okay, well, assuming that musical training does have a causative role in enhancing how we track pitch and speech, how would this possibly work? Well, one possibility is that these, these, these basement brain centers um, are actually changing as a function of musical experience. That's, that is, there's plasticity or changes in, in the bracement of the brain. And remember, this is supposedly the ancient reptilian innate part of the brain. Somehow, this part of the brain could be changing and improving its performance. And that is, in a sense, plausible because these changes could be driven by input from projections that go from the cortex down to these centers. And there are many, many, many such co connections. So in this graphical picture, I've sh I'm showing on one side of the brain uh, both sides of the brain, excuse me, the ascending connections with these solid red lines. But there are descending projections that go down, start at the top and go back down. And in fact, we know from auditory neuroscience that the number of neurons, number of fibers that go down from the cortex down to the brainstem are actually far outnumber the number that go up. So in other words, the brain is, is sending massive signals down there and it could, that could be changing the, the response properties of these lower centers. Okay. Now, if, if plasticity is changing, is playing a role, if musical experience is really changing your fundamental processing of these sounds, why would it happen? Especially because musical melodies often seem simpler than speech acoustically. So if you look at a, a picture of a musical melody, so this is the first few notes of Amazing Grace that's played on a flute. This is a spectrogram, so this is frequency and this is time, and this is the first few notes here. Um, so this would be amazing grace and so on. Um, it's a pretty simple signal. There would be upper harmonics, but it's pretty simple. And you compare that to speech. Uh, here's a person saying, I can see you. Again, frequency here and time. And there's just all kinds of complexity in that signal in terms of the acoustic structure. So the underlying question is, how can learning to produce a simple signal enhance the processing of a complex signal? And that's where the precision idea of opera comes in. And it says that for certain acoustic features, music places higher demands on shared auditory networks than speech does in terms of the precision of processing. Let me try and unpack that a bit. Okay, so, so what are the precision demands that we put on the ability to perceive pitch modulations in speech? We know that pitch modulations or F0 variation is highly structured in speech and carries a lot of information. So there's information about prosody, for example, about what, what word is being focused on, where the phrase boundaries are, about affect, about the emotional tone. And in tone languages, as, we, as we've seen, the pitch can completely change the meanings of words. So pitch can carry a lot of information in language. But here's the critical question. What degree of encoding is good enough for basic speech perception? That is understanding the words in normal spoken sentences. Another way of asking that is how is intelligibility impacted if you don't have much sensitivity to this pitch variation? This question inspired us to conduct an experiment with native speakers of Mandarin. And so we had native speakers listening to sentences like, a hurricane was announced this afternoon on the TV. In Mandarin, they, they got to listen to them once and they had to write down what they heard. And some sentences had their intact pitch modulations, just natural pitch modulations, and some we completely flattened to uh, like a board, I mean just a mo complete monotone. And these are native speakers of Mandarin listening down and writing what they hear. And what we found was when there was no noise, no background noise, people were just as good at understanding the flat sentences as they were at understanding the sentences with pitch variation, even though we know pitch can contribute to word meaning in Mandarin. 
When you add noise, then it starts to get difficult. And the gray line shows performance in noise, and the black line performance in uh, uh, without. No, I'm sorry. The gray line shows performance on the monotone sentences, and the black line on the intact sentences. And when the noise and the uh, sentence are at equal volume, you're about 20% worse if you don't have the pitch variations. So it does seem to impact the ability to pull speech out of noise. You can ask, though, why is speech perception and quiet so robust, even when pitch is supposedly carrying a ton of information in a language? Well, natural sentence perception involves the integration of many cues and phonetic features with significant redundancy between them. And, and you pr often predict what's coming up next. So if some part of the signal is degraded, you can sort of compensate with other parts of the signal. It's a very robust system. And that's adaptive. Um, because it means that you, there can be inborn variant, variation in how well you encode a particular feature in speech, and you can be okay because there are other features that can compensate. So it's a desirable system in an evolved communication system. And we know there are individuals with degraded pitch perception who are fine in terms of everyday speech communication. There's, there's much research on congenital amusia or musical tone deafness by Isabel Peretz and Gottfried Schlag and other colleagues. I've done some work in this area, and these people do have subtle pitch perception deficits that seem to seriously impact their perception of music, although they do find in everyday language because there are other cues they can latch onto even if they're not getting the exact details of the pitch contours. All right, so you can tolerate not such so great pitch perception in speech, but in music, you can't get away with it. Um, a lot of information is in, in music is highly structured information and has to do with very small changes in pitch. So musical melodies, in musical melodies, small differences are structurally very important. So this little melody will contain a note that will probably pop out to you as being wrong. Or a few notes, actually. So, um, but those notes are, are only you know, a semitone off from where they should be. So it's, it's a small difference. If I made that same manipulation to a sentence of Mandarin or a sentence of English, you probably wouldn't even hear the difference between the natural sentence and the manipulated sentence. So we, we care about these fine distinctions in music. So that what's good enough for uh, music is a lot more precise than what's good enough for speech. So music tolerates a narrower range of, of precision encoding. So that's the basic idea. Um, there's some technicalities that actually I'll just go through quickly because they're not so important. But the idea is that you can not be so good at pitch, but still be good at perceiving the phonetic structure of speech, because you can be fine at encoding timbre or the spectral structure. And um, the idea that music training, learning to play a musical instrument is auditory training. I mean, you are learning to play, you're learning something motor, but you're also learning to listen to yourself. And you're constantly making a loop between your hearing and your playing. And that action perception link may be very important in driving neural plasticity, along with emotion, repetition, and attention. And that's what I'll. Uh, end up with here. So musical training, the idea here is that musical training links high precision demands on auditory processing to positive emotion, extensive repetition, and focused attention. And these all help drive neuroplasticity. And we know this from animal research. If you want to change an animal's brain in the way that it processes sound, if you link that sound to emotion, to repetition, you make it a focus of attention, that brain will change more quickly perhaps due to cholinergic systems or increases in the synchrony of firing of cells. The mechanisms are still under investigation, but the idea is that these do have an effect. Bottom line of the idea is that somehow music is acting like boot camp for your auditory system, but boot camp that you're enjoying. So unlike normal boot camp in the military where you, you're suffering, uh, this is boot camp. It's hard, but it feels good, and you want to do it, and you want to do it over and over again because of the emotional rewards of, of, of listening to and making music. So how do you test such an idea? Well, I would welcome suggestions from you. I have my own ideas, but I won't, in the interest of time, I won't go through them. Um, but I think you do need to do training studies that impose high precision demands on specific acoustic features, and Opera predicts that that will lead to enhanced neural encoding of those features in speech, even if you're not training speech directly. And since speech involves the encoding of many features, like spectral shape and amplitude envelope and so forth, Opera should apply to any of these, not just to F0 or pitches, which is what I've talked about. But then the real world question is, why would you use music to enhance speech processing? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, music can isolate specific acoustic features. So, so this is unlike speech. Speech al always involves co-variation of many features, spectrum, pitch, amplitude, rhythm. In music, you can really pin down and say, I really only want to train rhythm. So I'm going to make all the notes the same pitch, and I'm going to make them the same timbre. Or I only want to train melody, so I'm going to make the notes the same duration and so forth. So you can really focus 
the perceptual system on one feature at a time and not be diverted by semantic meaning, just focusing on sound per se. Musical activities are often fun, and this is useful for training children who will, if you want to, them to engage in some repetitive kind of training paradigm, if you make something that's fun, they're much more likely to do it voluntarily, especially if you take, send them home with it. And I discuss these ideas further in the paper that I mentioned. So to put things in a broader context, it's likely that learning a musical instrument influences several brain systems that can affect language function. Uh, I've talked about encoding, but there's many other systems. There's working memory, there's attention, executive function, and so forth. And probably these all interact in the brain. And so what you really need to do is multi-level longitudinal experiments. That is experiments where you actively randomly assign children to music training or some other kind of pleasurable artistic training like painting. And you study the impact of this on speech and language processing by measuring the brain at many levels, cortex and subcortex, really thinking in terms of these interactions uh, between the levels um, that Dr. Krauss has emphasized. So just to conclude, I think there's increasing evidence that music is biologically powerful, that it, in our lifetime it has lasting impacts on non-musical brain functions. It's what I call a transformative technology of the mind, it's, um, and I have a chapter on music and evolution where I go into that idea in some detail, if you're interested. But I think even if that's true, we need conceptual frameworks for understanding how and why these benefits occur. And it's, as Connie Tomeno mentioned, uh, if we're going to connect music therapy and music and medicine and, and basic cognition, we want to do it through understanding both the effects and how and why those effects are happening. And opera is just one proposal. It might be focusing on basic science. It could be wrong, but it, it, it's a proposal. It makes testable predictions. Um, and I think that's the direction we need to go if we're going to capitalize on music's use for education and neural rehabilitation. So I uh, thank you very much for your attention again. Okay. Questions for Dr. Patel? Doug? Yes, um, you spoke of, of musical training and its positive correlation with, uh, with language perception. And yeah, so yeah. Uh, have you been able to tease out the nature versus nurture? To what extent is if someone who's into music has innate yeah. physical ability versus having right. been trained in that? Yeah, no, that, is, that is absolutely a fundamental question. and. Um, I suspect both are at play. The only way to tease those things apart is through um, randomized experimental studies where you can actually randomly assign people to music training or some other form of training and look at, uh, you know, most studies have been correlational and it's just starting. The randomized control studies are just starting. But that, I think that's the only way. Yeah. Yes? Enhanced, has music been in, linked to multilingualism? Yeah, has, has enhanced ability to perceive speech? Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm, I hope I understand your question. So there's work on relationships between musical abilities and, say, the ability to pick up the sounds of a second language. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Right. Oh, do that for you. Yes, so there is work on multilingualism also having some effects on enhanced um, perception of speech. So that's, that's learning multiple languages can have an impact on how you perceive your first language. That's true. But those aren't always beneficial. It depends how close the second language is to the first language. You can also have competitive effects uh, depending on the structures of the languages. So, yeah. um, Gustavo Dudamel, the conductor of you know, he has a program. He had a program in Venezuela and now in L.A. Yes. Is anyone, for music for all children, Yes. is anyone looking at the effects of that? Yes. Actually, uh, yes. Uh, that specific program, I, I'm not sure. I mean, Nina Krauss has a project in L.A. looking at schools, and we're trying to get a project going in San Diego that's pretty much inspired by these, the uh, El Sistema, where there's um, the, the San Diego Youth Symphony is working with children in some of the lower income neighborhoods in San Diego providing free orchestral music lessons and we're hoping to track um, cognitive and brain structural development in these children. Yeah. Those would seem to be good cohorts to look at rhythm and reading ability too. Absolutely. Right? right? Like yes. we talked about this morning. Yes. There's no short answer to this question, but I'm interested in the relationship between music and mathematics. Yeah. And I'm wondering if you have a thought or at least a reference or two that Sure, yeah. Um, the, uh, 
I mean, that's an old and, and, and uh, interesting question. So um, I'm probably other people, my colleagues, that can come up with other papers. I, the one that sticks in my mind is a paper by Elizabeth Spelke. I don't think it's even published yet. It was in a Dana Consortium report at Gottfried is nodding, so he's probably seen this. Um, looking, at, It's really an interesting paper because she says, you know, mathematical and numerical cognition has many subcomponents. And so she tries to tease out which ones seem to be related to musical ability. Gottfried, do you want to speak to that? Uh, I, I just wanted to make a general comment since it has uh, come up now a few times. Um, about these um, extra musical cognitive effects and what the support for this is. Um, it is, you know, as also has come out, it's extremely difficult to actually do causal studies yeah. that, uh, that would prove this of things that one has seen in correlational studies yeah. to actually really show and attribute this to music. So, and I, I we have actually done a longitudinal causal study, and so we've struggled through all of this. And one thing I want to point out is that obviously one can go back and look at baseline assessments of these kids when they pick up their musical instrument mm -hmm. to try to find out whether or not those <coughs> ones that really excel right. are the ones that have actually a different kind of anatomy. Yes. As a neuroscientist, I, um, I, I believe that the brain is plastic, Right. However, as a musician, I also have to say there are people out there that, has, that have always been better than myself um, in yeah. motor skills and sensory skills. Yeah. So I've also come to the realization that there may be structural and functional correlates of musical skills that I cannot get to even with really um, uh, intense practice. And one other thing yeah. I want to point out that an ideal study would obviously be if we can randomize children to two different interventions that would be balanced and that could isolate just a musical component right. that we would like to address. Right. However, having faced this in reality, I would, I would challenge everybody to imagine randomizing somebody to learning a musical instrument in an environment or in a household where nobody else plays a musical instrument what would that actually mean for this child? You know, it does require an environment where parents can actually practice with a child or can support the yeah. practice. And if you don't have this yeah. in this household, then randomizing that child to that musical intervention may not really give you some effect. So yeah. in, in, in summary, it is extremely difficult to prove what we all believe might actually be true, yeah. but to really show this in causal studies would be very difficult. Yeah, and, and also to do it with children, it makes it all the more complicated. Annie and yeah. Gottfried, I think um, something that might help the non-scientists in the audience is to actually define what uh, plasticity of the brain means, because that's a very oh. important concept, and what we kind of were taught in medical school 15 years ago and what we're taught today. So I want you two guys to say a few words about that. Well, there, there, there are so many different definitions of plasticity, but most of the time when we talk about plasticity, maybe today and maybe also what we talk about tomorrow, is really use-dependent or experience-dependent plasticity. Mm -hmm. And one can define this both in functional as well as in structural terms. In functional terms, it might be that connections between brain cells may be more intensely structured, that, that the synapses may be changed so that the cells can more intensely talk to each other, or that that interaction is modulated through some other ways. Structurally, and that has been, when I went to medical school, the, the common notion was that the brain after a certain age does not change anymore in structure. That's actually, I, th I remember that I was taught after five years of age, the brain basically looks like an adult brain. I think nowadays we have come to the realization yeah. that brains can change structurally, and that has been shown a lot in animal experiments by showing that not only support cells in the brain, such as glial cells or vessels can change, but we can also have an up or down regulation of synapses, of the connections, and we can have also new brain cells that uh, show up even in adult brains. 
So that's what we mean by structural plasticity. I think tomorrow we will also hear about what happens if you take a huge chunk of a brain away, can other parts of the brain take over that function? And that is obviously in some ways functional and structural plasticity as well, but in a, in a very different way, we, one could define that as plasticity. That was great, thank you. Yeah, I can't improve on that. <laughs> One more question, or, sorry. Or, oh, okay. Yeah, I get the difficulty of really accurate causal studies, yeah. but with that in mind, um, a lot of the, what you're doing is based on specific instrument, mm -hmm. a lot of motor, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of uh, gross motor, and you know, very instrument based. Mm -hmm. is, are there studies, are you studying, does anybody here know, if they're doing studies that have to do with singing mm. as being uh, song singing specifically as a or just singing in general mm -hmm. as the training instrument right and then that's the first side of that question yeah. and the second side of that question is um is there anyone doing specifically song singing studies song about song singing enhancing uh, speech processing. Oh, wow. You, well, this perfect segue into Isabel's talk. <laughs> Isabel's, that's Thank Isabel's you. entire topic. <laughs> we'll right. let, uh, do you want to get ready, Isabel? I'm going to let one more question as you're changing. Um, I'm wondering what comments you have on classical versus non-classical, tonal versus atonal, and... Where, where are you? Oh, sorry. I, I don't do well with disembodied voices. So I'm just, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead. What comments do you have on the sim similar studies on classical versus non-classical, tonal versus non-tonal, oh, and some In terms African of these training studies, you mean? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it, it almost doesn't matter if, what kind of music you're learning as long as you're passionate about it and you're determined to do it well. I think that's what matters, is if you care about the music and you want to get good at it, you know, almost any genre of music is going to place very high demands on your, your skills with jazz or pop or, or, um, or classical, yeah, so. Thank you, Annie, for another terrific talk, so.